Toyota didn't invent the compact car, but it practically perfected it with the Corolla. It also wasn't the first to make a mass market hybrid, but it's probably the first to come to mind after 20 years of building them. See where I'm going with this yet? Yeah, it makes an awful lot of sense that the brand finally brought the two together, and this Corolla Hybrid is cheaper than a Prius and delivers otherworldly efficiency, but it's still a Corolla, which means it's probably pretty reliable too. In short, there is an awful lot to like here for not a whole lot of money. For more expert car reviews, don't forget to share our channel and subscribe so you can catch some of this and maybe even a little of that. I went over this last time I reviewed a Corolla, but it's probably worth repeating. I usually don't talk about reliability in my reviews because it's not something I can judge after just a week behind the wheel. But if there was an exception to that rule, it would be the Toyota Corolla. We all have a friend, family member, or neighbor who drove one forever without any issue. And if you look the Corolla up in Consumer Reports or something like that, it's all usually pretty favorable. Now, obviously it's not a guarantee, but this thing does stand a pretty good chance of sticking around long after you're done making payments on it. And the same goes with the hybrid powertrain that's under this one I'm driving. It's the same one that Toyota has been using in the Prius for a good dozen years or so. Now, I know you're probably really looking forward to me talking about my favorite part about this car, which is the fuel efficiency, but you are going to have to wait just a little while longer. And now speaking of the Prius, I personally don't have a problem with the way it looks, but this is obviously going to be a lot more palatable for a lot more people. It just doesn't stand out the same way as that purpose-built hybrid. This just looks like a Corolla, and the only indication that it's the hybrid is that little badge on the trunk. If there was a downside here, it would be that you can't get the Corolla hybrid with all-wheel drive, and that is something you can get with the Prius, but then this is quite a bit cheaper. This one I'm driving has the premium package and it's priced right around 29 grand before tax, whereas the cheapest Prius you can buy starts around 31,000 bucks. And if I'm right in assuming that a big part of the appeal of a small hybrid like this is affordability, that money's probably better served in your pocket than Toyota's. And if you don't mind skipping the premium package, you can get one of these things for around 27 grand before tax. And there's still some good stuff like heated front seats, automatic climate control, and this eight inch touchscreen infotainment system that has both Apple CarPlay and Android Auto connections. It also comes with good advanced safety stuff like blind spot monitoring with rear cross traffic alert, automatic high beams and lane departure warning. And there's also lane keeping and steering assist as well as adaptive cruise control that works in stop and go traffic and automatic emergency braking with pedestrian and cyclist detection. Now, if I had a complaint about the way the advanced safety stuff works, it would be about the adaptive cruise control. It keeps just wide enough of a gap for other drivers to sneak in front of you if you are following another vehicle, even in its closest setting. And that can be annoying for you as well as all the people behind you as your car slows down. And then the other thing is the steering assist. It's just not all that smooth. Let's say you wanna, I don't know, give a big truck that's coming towards you some extra room just to be safe. Well, you've really gotta tug at the wheel to move over. It feels like you're fighting against it and it's not really working with you, which really runs against what should be happening here, but it doesn't take too long to get used to the system overall. Anyway, if you do go for the premium package, it adds about two grand to the price and you get some good creature comforts like a power adjustable driver's seat, this faux leather upholstery, a heated steering wheel and heated rear seats and a wireless phone charger. Though it's pretty useless since those phone connections are wired. Now it's a good thing they are here though because this infotainment system isn't all that great without them. The interface isn't spectacular. So it's nice to be able to hook your phone up and it gives you a little more than just this little screen that you can pull up to look at how much energy you're using. But then the other thing about it, well, this screen has these tiny little buttons 
and I don't like them at all because they're hard to read at a glance. I really do try to minimize what I'm doing behind the wheel aside from paying attention to the road and what's happening around me. But let's say I wanna pull up my map. Super cool that this button is a shortcut to my Google Maps, even through Apple CarPlay, but it's not all that easy to see at a glance. And the same goes with the buttons for the HVAC. The labels are so tiny and hard to read. But then in contrast to all those tiny buttons are these massive rockers for the heated front seats that are tucked way under this dashboard. And that's also where this wireless charging pad is. And then the same goes with the USB port you need to plug into those phone connections. It's way under this ledge here. There also isn't a ton of small item storage up here. This console bin, not all that big. You do have this little slot for your phone, but the door pockets are pretty tiny and that's about it. But those are all the complaints I have about the cabin. It is pretty roomy in here, as you can see. And a big reason why? No sunroof. And I know some of you might want one, especially for something this close to 30 grand, but I am fine with it because the Corolla with a sunroof is very tight for me. I'm about six foot three and I have no headroom. But as you can see, I have plenty in here and I really do like that. And the cabin is pretty wide overall. And as far as driving goes, well, outward visibility is fantastic. These windows are huge. There aren't many blind spots at all. Doesn't matter which direction you're talking, but again, you do have that blind spot monitoring as well. And that is nice to have. Now I will say rideshare drivers take note. There isn't a ton of headroom in the back and the door openings aren't all that huge. Could be a problem. And then with the trunk, well, it's pretty big overall. It's not too much smaller than the biggest entries in this class, but the bigger issue I have, those exposed hinges. That means you gotta be careful with whatever you're putting back there because they swing down and they could cause damage to your stuff in the back. But again, it is a big trunk overall. It's nice and deep. And these back seats do fold down if you need that pass through as well. Pretty roomy car overall, but that's not the best part. The best part is actually the drive. I know that might seem a little bit surprising. And no, I'm not saying this thing is sporty, but overall it is pretty agile, especially for a hybrid. The steering doesn't give you all that much, but the chassis response is very sharp. And that's something I do like, and you're gonna appreciate regardless of whether you enjoy driving or not. It's always nice to know what's happening and to be able to have a car that is very responsive in the event of an emergency. And the other thing is the ride quality is really good too. There's a sort of a comfortable composed compliance, I would say. It rides really nicely over bumps, even on very rough roads or over train tracks. It is very smooth. And a big reason why is the fact that this is a hybrid. So the damping is a little bit different because of the extra weight. And another thing about the drive, it is very quiet in here. And that's something else that's important in a hybrid. And that also brings us to the most important part about this car in general. And that is the powertrain. Like I said, it's basically the same one you get in the Prius. It's a 1.8 liter four cylinder gas engine. And that's paired to an electric motor that makes 71 horsepower on its own. And then there's a continuously variable transmission that gets it all to the front wheels. Now combined output, it's only 121 horsepower, not all that much, but trust me, it is more than enough. It doesn't feel like this thing is underpowered at all. And if you do get into the gas, it gets up and goes just like any compact car out there. Don't expect sport compact acceleration, but it's more than fine for passing and merging and stuff like that. Another thing about accelerating, well, you're best to stay out of the gas engine as much as possible, and it does get pretty buzzy when it kicks in. But if you're gentle on the throttle and you're accelerating away from a standing start, well, it will start under electric propulsion. And then the same goes if you're coasting. If you let off that throttle pedal, it will kick over to battery power. And that is great for fuel efficiency. And speaking of efficiency, that is my favorite part about this car. Officially, it's rated for about four and a half liters combined, which is pretty average for a small hybrid like this one. And I wouldn't be disappointed if I was achieving those numbers on my own, but I have been absolutely smashing them this week. I went for my evaluation drive the other day and it was 270 kilometers. It really was a lot of highway and secondary roads and just a little bit of city sprinkled in. And that's usually where hybrids do their best work because you can use the brakes 
and you're going at low speeds, which means that you can stay under that electric power more of the time. But I averaged just 3.6 liters per 100 kilometers, which is insane. As one of my friends put it when I told him, it's hard to even fathom what it's like burning such little fuel. And to the guy who asked me in my Sienna review if I was being honest about that fuel efficiency, I absolutely was. I'm not just basing that on the computer. I did a manual calculation and I averaged 3.612 liters per 100 kilometers over that 270 kilometers or so. I'm just so impressed. Now, the most efficient hybrid you can buy, I'm pretty sure, is still the Hyundai Ioniq. And that's officially rated for something like four liters per 100 kilometers. But I'm telling you right now, look past the official numbers because this thing really will give that a run for its money. And the other thing, I haven't been hypermiling or trying all that hard to burn as little gas as possible. Yeah, I've had it in eco mode, but I haven't changed my driving behavior. I drive around by myself. I have the air conditioning in eco mode as well, but otherwise I've just been doing what I do in any other vehicle. And that's what really makes this so impressive. And that's also why I think you shouldn't take any of those little complaints I've had to heart. I wouldn't let the lack of space or small item storage or even this infotainment system bother me because there really is a lot to like about this car. And if you're looking for something affordable and efficient, I would definitely recommend taking the Corolla Hybrid out for a spin. To recap, I like how incredibly efficient the Toyota Corolla Hybrid is, that it's affordable, and it's probably going to be pretty reliable. I don't like that there's no satellite radio, the tiny buttons for the infotainment system, or the exposed hinges in the trunk. The Toyota Corolla Hybrid isn't exactly an exciting car, but not many others are this efficient. And now consider this little sedan's notoriety for lasting approximately forever, and it just might be worth getting hyped about after all.